Hello to everyone. Welcome. Let me say students. Students of this wonderful Gospel of Luke. We're close to ending this Gospel of Luke. But in the meantime, let's focus on the Word of God. and open our minds, heart and ears. This is your pastor, Yeti, and welcome. We're going to stay in Luke chapter 22. In the upper room, Jesus has steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem knowing full well what would happen to him there, and now those events were about to occur. They were appointments, not accidents, for they had been determined by the Father and written centuries ago in the Old Testament scriptures. Luke 24, 26-27. And please note these scripture verses and write them down. It helps you to refer to them when you study. We cannot but admire our Savior and love him more as we see him courageously enter into this time of suffering and eventually death. We must remember that he did it for us. The Passover supper in the upper room gives us the focus for our present study. Before the supper preparation. So as I say, we stay in chapter 22, but to give you the verses 1 to 13. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles were the three most important feasts on the Jewish calendar. Leviticus, and that you find in the Old Testament, 23. And all the Jewish men were expected to go to Jerusalem each year to celebrate Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. The, past, the Feast of Passover commemorate the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, and it was a time for both remembering and rejoicing. Exodus chapter 11 and 12. Thousands of excited pilgrims crowded in and around Jerusalem during that week, always causing the Romans to be nervous about possible uprisings. Passover had strong political overtones, and it was the ideal time for some would-be Messiah to attempt to overthrow Rome. This explains why King Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, were in Jerusalem instead of being at Tiberias and Caesarea, respectively. They wanted to help keep the peace. The religious leaders prepared for a crime. Verses 1 to 6. It is incredible that these men perpetrated historic, history's greatest crime during Israel's holiest festival. During Passover, the Jews were expected to remove all leaven, yeast, from their houses. Exodus 12 Verse 15, as a reminder that their ancestors left Egypt in haste and had to eat unleavened bread. Jesus had warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke 12, verse 1, and see Matthew 16, verses 6, and 1 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 1 to 8.
The religious leaders had cleansed their homes, but not their hearts. For a long time now, they had wanted to arrest Jesus and get him out of the way, but they had not been able to work out a safe plan that would protect them from the people. Judas solved their problems for them. He guaranteed to deliver Jesus to them privately so there would be no uproar from the people. The last thing the Jewish Sanhedrin wanted was a messianic uprising at Passover season. Judas was motivated and energized by Satan, for he never was a true believer in Jesus Christ. His sins had never been cleansed by the Lord, and he had never believed and received eternal life. Yet none of the other apostles had the least suspicion that Judas was a traitor. We have every reason to believe that Judas had been given the same authority as the other man and that he had preached the same message and performed the same miracles. It shows how close a person can come to God's kingdom and still be lost. Matthew 7, 21-27 why did Judas betray the Lord Jesus? We know that he was a thief. John 12, 4-6 And that money played a part in his terrible deed. But 30 pieces of silver was not a large payment for such a great crime. And there had to be something more involved. It is possible that Judas saw in Jesus the salvation of the Jewish nation, and therefore he followed him because he hoped to hold on office in the kingdom. Keep in mind that the twelve often argued over who was the greatest in the kingdom, and Judas, the treasurer, surely participated in those important discussions. When Judas understood that Jesus would not establish the kingdom, but rather would surrender to the authorities. He turned against him in better retaliation. The leaven in his life grew quietly and secretly until it produces malice and wickedness. When you cooperate with Satan, you pay dearly, and Judas ended up destroying himself. Satan is a liar and a murderer, John 8, 44. And he reproduced himself perfectly in Judas. Jesus prepared for the Passover, verses 7 to 13. The way our Lord arranged for the Passover feast indicates that he knew there were plots afoot. Until the disciples arrived at the upper room, only Jesus and Peter and John had known where the feast would be held. Had Judas known he might have been tempted to inform the authorities, Peter and John would have no trouble locating the man with the water pitcher, because men rarely carried pitchers of water. This was the task of the woman. Like the man who owned the ass and colt, this anonymous man was a disciple of Jesus who made his house available to the master for his last Passover. Peter and John would purchase an approved lamp and take it to the temple to be slain. Then they would take the lamp and the other elements of the supper to the house where they planted to meet. And there the lamp would be roasted. The table would be furnished with wine, unleavened bread, and the paste of bitter herbs that reminded the Jews of their long and bitter bondage in Egypt. See Exodus 12, 1-28, and please read. It is very important. Chronically question here that must be addressed or it will appear that the gospel writers are contradicting each other. According to John 18.28, 
the Jewish leaders had not yet eaten the Passover, and the day Jesus was tried and condemned was the preparation of the Passover. John 19, 14. But our Lord and his disciples had already eaten the Passover. In their excellent harmony of the Gospels, Harper and Rowe, Robert Thomas and Stanley Grundy suggest a possible solution to the dilemma. You can find it in the 320 to 23 in the books. The Jews at that time reckoned days in one of two ways, from sunset to sunset, or from sunrise to sunrise. The first approach was traditionally Jewish, Genesis 1 verse 5, while the second was Roman, though it had biblical precedent. See Genesis 8.22. If Mark, Matthew, and Luke used the Jewish reckoning and John the Roman, then there is no contradiction. There was an overlapping of days that permitted both groups to celebrate on the same date, but a different day. The temple priest permitted the Jews to bring their lambs for sacrifice, either the earlier or the later time. Apparently, the Jewish leaders followed the Roman form of reckoning. John 18, 28. While Jesus and the disciples followed the Jewish form, our Lord was crucified on Passover at the time when the lambs were being slain, becoming a fulfillment of Old Testament type. During the supper, Revelation, <clears throat> 22, verse 14 to 16, and 21 to 38. The disciples did not know what to expect as they meet in the upper room, but it turned out to be an evening of painful revelation. So it's not the book of Revelation. As I said in the beginning, we stay in chapter 22 of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, the host of the supper, met them with a traditional kiss of peace. He kissed Judas, and then the man reclined around the table. Judas at our Lord's left, and John had his right. Jesus revealed his love. He did this by what he said and by what he did. He told his friends that he had a great desire to share this last Passover with them before he suffered. Passover commemorate the exodus of Israel from Egypt centuries before, but he would accomplish a greater exodus on the cross. He would purchase redemption for sin for a world of lost sinners. Then he arose, girded himself with a towel, and washed the disciples' feet, including Judas. Later that evening, the twelve would argue over which of them was the greatest. So this lesson on humility and service did not penetrate their hearts. Perhaps Peter had a scene in mind when years later he admonished his readers to be clothed with humility. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, and see Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Our Lord's words in Luke 22, 16 indicate that there would be no more Passover on God's calendar. The next feast would be the Great Kingdom Feast, 
when he would return to establish his rule on earth. Luke 22, 28-30, chapter 13, 24-30, and Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. He saw beyond the suffering to the glory, beyond the cross to the crown, and in his love he reached out to include his friends. Jesus revealed the presence of treasury, verses 21 to 23. He had already hinted to his disciples that one of their number was not truly with him. But now he openly spoke about a traitor, a traitor in their midst. However, he did not do this just for the sake of the disciples, but more for the sake of Judas. Jesus has kissed Judas and washed his feet. And now he was giving Judas another opportunity to repent. It is most significant that Jesus did not openly identify Judas as a traitor, but protected him until the very end. If Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, why did he choose him in the first place? And if somebody had to betray the Lord, why condemn Judas? After all, he simply did God's will and fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. See Psalm 41, 9. Psalm 55, 12 to 14, and compare Psalm 69, 25, and 109, verse 8, with Acts 1, 15 to 20. Before he chooses 12 apostles, Jesus spent a whole night in prayer. Luke 6, 12 to 16. So he must believe that it was the Father's will that Judas be among them. John 8, 29. But the selection of Judas did not sail his faith. Rather, it gave him opportunity to watch the Lord Jesus closely, believe, and be saved. God, in his sovereignty, had determined that his son would be betrayed by a friend. But the fine for knowledge does not destroy human responsibility or accountability. Judas made each decision freely and would be judged accordingly, even though he still fulfilled the decree of God. Acts 2, 23 The fact that the disciples were puzzled by this strange announcement reveals that they did not know Judas' true character. Their own hearts, which of us could do such a terrible thing, or the prophecies in the Psalms, nor did they remember the Lord's statements that he would be betrayed into the hands of the enemy. If Peter had fully understood what was happening, he might have used his sword on Judas. Much about Judas remains a mystery to us, and we must not speculate too much. Judas is certainly a witness to the sinlessness of Jesus Christ, for if anybody could have given witness against him, it was Judas. However, the authorities had to find false witnesses in order to build their case against Jesus. Judas admitted that he had betrayed innocent blood. Matthew 27, verse 4. At this point, Judas left the upper room to go to the religious leaders and get ready for the arrest of Judas, if, I mean for Jesus in the garden. Judas went out and it was night, for he was obeying the prince of darkness. Luke twenty-two fifty-three. Alas, for Judas it is still night and always will be night. Jesus revealed the disciples' worldliness. Verses 24 to 30. This was not the first time the disciples had committed this sin. Matthew 20, 20 to 28. Mark 9, 33 to 37. Luke 9, 46 to 48. But in the light of what their Lord had said and done that evening, this latest exhibition was inexcusable. Perhaps the argument grew out 
of their speculating over who would betray him. Or there may have been some jealousy over the way they had been seated at the table. When you are interested in promoting yourself, it doesn't take much to start an argument. Jesus had to explain that they were thinking like the unsaved Gentiles and not like God's children. The Romans in particular viewed for honors and did all they could, legally and illegally, to win promotion and recognition, but they are not the examples for us to follow. As in all things, Jesus is our example, and he has completely reversed the measure of true greatness. True greatness means to be like Jesus, and that means being a servant to others. A servant does not argue over who is the greatest, because he knows that he is the least, and he accepts this from the hand of God. Since all Christians are to be servants, there is no reason for us to compete with one another for honors and recognition. It is too bad that this competitive spirit is so strong in the church today as people promote themselves and their ministries as the greatest. Jesus closed this lesson on servanthood by reminding them of their future reward in the kingdom. Luke 22, 28-30 In spite of their weaknesses and failures, the disciples had stood by Jesus during his earthly ministry, and God would honor them for their faithfulness. We should not mind being servants today, for we shall sit on thrones in the future kingdom. For that matter, our faithful service today is preparing us for the rewards we shall receive. Jesus has set the example, first the cross, then the crown. Jesus revealed Peter's denial, verses 31 to 38. It is interesting that this word of warning followed the dispute over who was the greatest. Imagine how the disciples must have felt when they heard that not only would one of their number betray him, but that their spokesman and leader would publicly deny him. If a strong man like Peter was going to fail the Lord, what hopes was there for the rest of them? The word you in Luke 22, verse 31, is plural. Satan asked to have all the disciples so he might sift them like wheat. These men had been with Jesus in his trials, Luke 22, 28, and he would not forsake them in their trials. This was both a warning and an encouragement to Peter and the other men, and our Lord's Prayer were answered. Peter's courage failed, but not his fate. He was restored to fellowship with Christ and was greatly used to strengthen God's people. After the Supper, Commemoration 22, 17 to 20. It was when the Passover meal was drawing to a close, Matthew 26, 25 and Luke 22, verse 20, that Jesus instituted the ordinance that the church calls the communion. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, or the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, or the Eucharist, from the Greek word that means to give thanks. The Passover feast opened with a prayer of thanksgiving, followed by the drinking of the first of four cups of wine. The wine was diluted with water and was not intoxicating. Next they, are, next they eat the bitter herbs 
and sang Psalm 113 and 114. Then they drank the second cup of wine and began eating the lamb and the unleavened bread. After drinking the third cup of wine, they sang Psalm 115 and 118. And then the fourth cup was passed among them. It is likely that between the third and fourth cups of wine, Jesus instituted the supper. Paul gave the order of the supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26. First, Jesus broke a piece from the unleavened loaf, gave thanks, and shared it with the disciples, saying that it is represented his body, which was given for them. He then gave thanks for the cup and shared it, saying that it represented his blood. It was a simple observance that used the basic elements of a humble Jewish meal. Jesus sanctified the simple things of life and used them to convey profound spiritual truths. Jesus stated one of the purpose for the supper in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11, 24-25 It is a memorial feast to remind the believer that Jesus Christ gave his body and blood for the redemption of the world. There is no suggestion in the accounts of the supper that anything miraculous took place when Jesus blessed the bread and the cup. The bread remained bread and the wine remained wine. And the physical act of receiving the elements did not do anything special to the eleven disciples. When we partake, we identify ourselves with his body and blood. But there is no suggestion here that we receive his body and blood. A second purpose for the supper is to proclaim of his death until he returns. 1 Corinthians 11:26. The supper encourages us to look back with love and adoration to what he did for us on the cross and to look forward with hope and anticipation to his coming again. Since we must be careful not to come to the Lord's table with known sin in our lives, the supper should also be an occasion for looking within, examining our hearts, and confessing our sins. 1 Corinthians 11, 27-32 A third blessing from the supper is the reminder of the unity of the church. We are one loaf. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 It is the Lord's Supper and it is not exclusive property of any Christian denomination. Whenever we share in the supper, we are identifying with Christians everywhere and are reminded of our obligation to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bound of peace. Ephesians 4 verse 3 For us to receive a spiritual blessing from the supper, it takes more than mere physical participation. We must also be able to discern the body. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. That is, see the spiritual truth that are inherent in the bread and the cup. This spiritual discernment comes through the Spirit using the Word. The Holy Spirit makes all of this real to us as we wait before the Lord at the table. Following the instituting of the supper, Jesus taught his disciples many of these basic truths they desperately needed to know in order to have effective ministries in a hostile world. He prayed for his disciples, John 17. Then they sang a hymn and departed from the upper room for the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, Judas knew they would go there and he would have the arresting officers all prepared. As you review this passage, you cannot help but be impressed with the calmness and courage of the Savior. It is He who is in control, 
not Satan or Judas or the Sanhedrin. It is he who encourages the apostles and he is able even to sing a hymn before he goes out to die on a cross. Let me give some questions for personal reflection or for your group. First, what was so hypocritical about the Pharisees at this Passover time? 22 verses 1 to 6. How could Judas, one of the twelve men closer to Jesus, betray him? Why did he do it? Another one. How is Judas a witness of the sinlessness of Christ? What was the significance of Jesus' words in 22, 14 to 19? How can lay leaders and vocational Christian workers exercise strong leadership without lording it over others? How does Peter's self-confident boasting of his loyalty, verse 33, and his subsequent betrayal of Christ serve as a warning to us? And the last one, what are the purposes of the Lord's Supper? And this, my dear ones, is the end of chapter 22. I hope you enjoyed it because it is very deep, very opened our hearts and mind and the importance of the Lord's Supper, how he instituted it, how it is for us a healing, a forgiving and a blessing for our lives. May God bless you, may he protect you and may he shine on your face. And may the peace of the Lord be with you and stay with you. Amen. Bye.